Tom, it's good to see you. Thanks for being on the show. I mean, it's uh, it's been a while. <laughs> and then, you know, it's great to reconnect with you. I mean, we worked together, what was it, like 2001 or two when we were doing Warrior, the Warrior Leader Project and Arena and all that? Those that guys? was a long time ago. Yeah, I was, I was just thinking about that this morning when we first met and you were, you had a restaurant, you, uh, I think just came, come from the seals and right. we're working in business. And, uh, that was a long time ago. Yeah. Yeah. I'd, I'd gotten off, off active duty, stayed in the reserves and launched the Coronado Brewing Company. Yeah. And you were privy to some of the interesting challenges I had with my, <laughs> my brother-in-law partners. That's a two beer story right there. <laughs> <laughs> and then we were helping Dan or working with Dan a little bit, or I don't know if you were involved in that. You were, I think you were Dan O'Shea and, um, yeah, yeah, yeah his project called arena yeah and then um we also worked together on innisoft that's eric right. andrew and zj how yeah. are they doing are they, you know, i don't even all? know i like I, I think they're back in china or at least uh eric is probably back in china he had a his parents were medical researchers and they had some some uh drug, not really a drug. It was kind of a natural alternative that they were getting some pretty interesting results in cancer patients. Right. And so I actually flew over to China and went to uh, the hospital. And, and I don't even remember the name of the city, but all the cities in China have like, you know, 5 million people. And that's a small right. city. Incredible. So I went to this hospital and people were saying, yeah, I had this incurable cancer and, and got healed. And I was trying to help him out a little bit with that, but then I, I really lost track with him and I haven't heard from him in a long time. That was the first experience for me that I yeah, took a business and helped raise money. And you were the you know advisor to those guys and yeah. asked me to help out in an interim role. And what was interesting, bittersweet and a good learning for me is, you know, I brought in Scott, you remember Scott? We won't yeah. mention last names yeah. to, to kind of advise me on the raising of money. And, and lo and behold, when the term sheet comes in from Eldorado <laughs> Ventures, Who's the new CEO? Exactly. It's not Mark, it's Scott. Yeah. And, and, and then what? he fired those guys. And uh, yeah, and then he fired the founders and a bunch of money and <laughs> pissed it all away. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> he worked himself into the term sheet. <laughs> That's pretty funny. I know. So you are, um, you're a top coach to executives and athletes and whatnot. Tell us a little bit, Tom. I'm curious about this myself. I've heard your story, you know, from the stage, and I know you worked with Tony Robbins for a while. And so what, what what was kind of your origin story that got you into coaching and and wanting to help other people? You know, it probably starts when I was three years old, and I grew up in a military family. My dad mm -hmm. was a West Point graduate, okay, eighty uh, second Airborne, Fort Bragg, North Carolina. So we were stationed there, and then he went to Vietnam in 1963. Mm -hmm. So pretty early, he was a young guy, I think probably, you know, 29 years old, captain in the army right. and uh, was there 11 months, one month before coming back and then was killed, was killed in Vietnam. Oh and my. so I can still remember looking out the, my, I was three, but my bedroom door and, you know, my mom had been talking about my dad coming home and, and seeing a taxi cab pull up and an army guy, you know, army officer get out. And walking up to the house, I'm all excited. And my mom knew what was really going on. They were coming to tell her that mm. my dad had been killed in Vietnam the day before. And oh. this was back when there were only advisors in Vietnam. So it wasn't, right. uh, you know, it wasn't the full blown right. you know, whole military scale over there. You know, there was very, there was a few advisors and my dad, I think was maybe the hundredth person killed in the Vietnam war, out no of, you know, kidding. ended up being like 60,000 or something like that. Right. But when something like that happens to you at an early age, your life's not black and white anymore. Right. You, you don't look at it as, you know, just accepting everything because your life doesn't fit into the, you know, the neat little buckets the way everyone else else's does. Seems to be anyways. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. I mean, none right. of it does, but people, right. you know, say this is right, that's wrong. And Correct. I'm like, well, how could that be right? Because, you know, look at my life, like, you know, it doesn't fit. Mm -hmm. And, and so I, I had, you know, a lot of pain in my childhood. I had, uh, you know, and then I was worried about, you know, okay, I got to take care of my mom, my brothers, you know, all this. And so I, I just really started looking at life differently. And I was reading books by Wayne Dyer, um, Dennis Waitley, mm -hmm. Seeds of Greatness, Wayne Dyer, you know, uh, your erroneous zones. 
mm-hmm. not erogenous zones, but erroneous zones. I was reading that at like a ridiculously young age, you know, because I was really searching. And I went a pretty traditional path. I played, you know, some football at University of North Carolina College. You know, on the outside, I was kind of yeah. this person just, you know, doing what I thought was expected. But inside, I had lots of questions and I was searching, searching and, and trying to grow. And and I did. Um, I was with a Wall Street firm for a couple of years out of mm-hmm. college, was making good money, had a couple of houses. And I, I, did, I didn't love it. It's kind of like probably you when you were right. an accountant, right? I'm like, right. there's something else. And right. so I see this guy, Tony Robbins, come on. I was watching TV for some reason one morning because I didn't want to go into work. And <laughs> one of the morning shows, he comes on. he just written his first book, which was called Unlimited Power. So he wasn't even that. like a big name back then. Right. But I, I'm watching and I'm going, hey, I, I got to read that book. You know, I like what this guy's talking about. Like you have this power inside of you that is unlimited. And so I read the book. Uh, called up his office, like literally three days later, I said, when's your next seminar? And I said, is this weekend? I'm on the East Coast, flew out. And then my passion, once I saw where you could be in a business where you could have a bigger vision for other human beings and then help them grow into that, Mm -hmm. it just became addictive. You know, just like I know you're super passionate about that too. Yeah, that's fascinating. So you went to a seminar and did, how did you end up working with Tony? Like, did you just knock on his door and say, Hey, I want to be one nah, of your yeah. speaker coaches or how did that work out? Well, at first, when I went to the seminar, at first it was shocking because I don't know if you've been to a Tony Robbins seminar before, I've been but to I thought day, it was date with destiny, the six day one. You did. Okay, good. Yeah, I was good. invited to go to that. Uh, cause one of the, the guy who does their, uh, Tony's fire walking, um, he's in charge of all the fire walking stuff is uh, Bill O'Keefe. And he is a client, uh, a Kokoro, uh, yeah. attendee and whatnot. And so he invited me. I was in the front row with um, Gavin Newsom and Maria Shriver. <laughs> Neither mm-hmm. of whom gave me the time of day, by the way, which is kind of interesting. <laughs> nice. Yeah. 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 You said great, did great give you the time or didn't give you the time of day? Did not. <laughs> oh, okay. Sorry. Yeah. No, that's not good. <laughs> not to be yeah. expected, I guess. Neither one of those? Neither. No. Okay. Well, okay. Yeah. Well, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll definitely not vote him back into office next time. And Good Maria, call. I don't know yeah. what she's up to, but <laughs> I won't watch her anymore. Uh, so, yeah. Uh, you know, when, when I first, uh, what was your question again? I got caught up in that. What was the question? <laughs> I love it. Yeah. How did you end up working with Tony? Oh, how did I end up working with him? Yeah. yeah. So that wasn't the intent. Like I, had, I, was a, I was a financial advisor. I had all these clients, you know, I was doing well. I was young. I was like, 24 years old, but you know, I came out there. I just wanted to learn. I wanted to grow. And at first when I got in the room, like as you experienced, like people are dancing around. I'm like, what the heck is going on? Like I'm I've never seen it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And I was super uncomfortable. I was in my twenties. I was from the East coast. And so I'm, I'm like, you know, I don't know about this thing. Like, is this a cult? What's going on in here? And, but then, I, you know, he got up and he started talking. I'm like, Hey, this guy makes a lot of sense. Yeah. But it was really uncomfortable. As a matter of fact, I remember the first the, the first one. This was back in 1980, like 85, I think, or, so, or 86, maybe. And, uh, you know, I had to do this exercise where you had to mirror and match. Like, whatever the other person did, you had to do. Well, I'm matched up with LeVar Burton. And this guy's just going nuts. And I'm a more <laughs> reserved, you know, more introverted person. And I was really out of my element. But I, but I grew. And so that at the end of that program... Uh, he pitched this 14 day neuro linguistic programming certification program Mm -hmm. and I signed up for it. It was 14 days. Like you're gone for two weeks uh, from your job. And I went out, I came out again, it was in Palm Springs. I think I came out there and 14 days and I just thought it was incredibly powerful. And that's when I decided, Hey, I don't want to do the, fi- I mean, financial advisors, amazing line of work, but I didn't want to do that anymore. I wanted to help run his company. And so he had, he had another guy that was like the CEO at the time, or maybe the president. And I interviewed with that guy and, who didn't last that long, but I came on and then I ended up being the head of sales and marketing for him for almost three years. Okay. Yeah. Interesting. And you developed, um, was that when you first developed your speaking skills? Uh, did, were you on stage as well or would that come later? Yeah. So that's interesting because, you know, I don't know about you, but most of the things I'm really good at now, 
I sucked at in the beginning. And so I was not, yeah. <laughs> you know, I was, I was introverted. I was shy. I, I when I was six years old, uh, I was standing too close to my middle brother. I had two younger brothers. Uh, so when my dad died, we were three, two, and one. My mother, or six months right. was the youngest. My mother really had a lot on her plate, mm -hmm. but I was standing too close. We only had one golf club in the whole family. It was like a seven iron somebody gave us. And so we had to share it. And so I'm waiting for it. We're just in the backyard. I'm not even hitting a golf ball. He's just swinging it. And he swung it and he, he kind of spun around too quick and smacked me right in the mouth. Ouch. And so chipped my tooth down to the nerve. And so my mom took, took us to, took me to the free dentist at Fort Bragg, North Carolina. Mm -hmm. So they weren't that interested in making it look pretty and nice. It's like, <laughs> all right, you know, you're not paying any money. How do we, how do we get this kid out of here? So I remember he put like a little <laughs> cock or something on the nerve and then he, he did a gold band around it. Right. Oh, so wow. now it's cool. It's called a grill, but at six years old to about, nine years old, I had like a gold tooth. So I never opened my mouth <laughs> and I was really shy. Oh my God. And I remember we, we hit, uh, I came on, I was running Tony to, uh, sales for sales and marketing for Tony. And we hit like a thousand people in a program, which was like a big deal. And he was excited. And he said, I want to do something special for you. I thought I was going to get a Rolex or, <laughs> you know, a, a Ferrari or something. He said, I'm going to let you do the introduction to the seminar. <laughs> I'm like, what? Right. I'm thinking that sucks. I don't want to stand in front of a thousand people. And I blew it. You know, I stripped no, it out what I was going to say, which is the worst thing you can do, obviously. Right. And then I, I lost my strip. <laughs> I lost my strip that morning. I put it somewhere and I was doing something else and someone threw it away. So they're like, get up there, get up there. And I get up there and I, I don't I don't know if this has ever happened to you before, but I, I totally I could not remember one doggone thing I was going to say. And so I'm sweating <laughs> a thousand people. That sounds I'm, like a my bad heart, dream. Oh, my God. Oh, it's a very bad dream. And, and the only thing I think I said was I said, please welcome Tony Robbins. And I ran <laughs> off the stage. And then I, I literally, I told myself, I'm not good at this. I can't do this. But fortunately, you know, uh, Tony's still a good friend. And, uh, but he had a saying back then. It was, if you can't, you must. Mm -hmm. And if you must, if you make it a must, you will. And so mm -hmm. I just started, I, I said, all right, I got to get good at this. And I started looking at people that were great at it, like, like him, but also other people. And, and I figured out it's, it's really not that hard. There's three things, you know, to speak. You need to, ha you need to have a compelling message, mm -hmm. figure out how to do that. You need to feel like a winner. So that mindset, you got to feel really good. You have to be in growth mode, not protection mode when you're right. up there. Right. And then the third thing is you have to energize and engage people. And the same thing with leadership. You know, I, I, don't, I don't think I was a great leader back then, but I learned a lot about leadership. And then same thing around performance. Like right. I remember being in college, playing, you know, I was on the football team, can't really say I played, but <laughs> not wanting to go in. Cause I like, I don't want to screw up in front of 60,000 people. And now I love pressure. I mean, one of our sayings in our house is we eat pressure for breakfast in the McCarthy house. <laughs> I love that. I'm going to write that down. We eat pressure for breakfast. It's kind of like the saying culture eats strategy for lunch, but slightly different. <laughs> yeah, to me. that's a good one too. Yeah. <laughs> so I want, I, this, because this is really fascinating grist. I still want to stick with your Tony experiences. Um, what what was he like for you? Was he a, a mentor, a boss, a friend, all of the above? And and because uh, Tony has this kind of outsized reputation, some people view him really positively. Some people aren't so sure. What yeah. was his experience like for you? Because I think Tony does a lot of good work, and and I've been to his program. I thought it was effective. Um, you know, it's one of those things. It's not for everybody, but it can be a powerful experience. Yeah. I would say, uh, first of all, he is one of the most generous, big hearted human beings on the planet. Mm. And, and, and then on top of that, uh, the thing I really learned from him and, and a lot of my work now, uh, is still based around this and, and people I'm meeting, uh, interested in meeting now, you know, like you, this is, this is something I think really, uh, is part of who you are he had incredible intent, like unwavering intent. Mm -hmm. So at a young age, because he was in his twenties and I met him too, he's older than me, but not a lot older. But when he would set his sight so big and it was almost like he didn't know what he couldn't do. Right. Which is great. Right. When you don't, when you don't know what you can't do, you do a lot of great things. When you convince yourself it can't be done, then 
you know, you don't have the unbeatable mind. I see that sign right in back mm -hmm. of you there. Mm -hmm. And so that's a, a big thing I learned from him. And a lot of people you see, they peak early and he certainly uh, hit a peak early, but he's just continued through time and uh, just was uh, working with him, actually helped bring him into a deal to, uh, to buy a big media company recently that mm. I don't know if it's going to go through, but he's just continuing his great work. And, and the big thing is just the power of his mind, you know, the, which we all have that power, but he just goes bigger in his mind than, you know, 99.9% .9 of all human beings. Right. Well, it makes sense. Cause he's a big dude. I mean, like the guy, <laughs> he, had, he had that kind of condition where he just didn't stop growing. Right, yeah. so isn't he like six ten or something like that, and just this it's massive like six seven six eight? Six, but eight. yeah, he was like like his family. I've met his uh, brother, uh, his sister. I think his brother's like you know five four five five. No kidding. <laughs> Tony in high school was like five one, and then had a tumor on his pituitary gland. Right, and then and then so had uh, a lot of growth hormone, uh, you know, large amounts of growth hormone and grew a lot uh, yeah. within like a year or two, like, you know, to the point where it was painful for him. Right. Do you think it's um, one last question? And I'll move on. But um, yeah. Tony has this mutant ability to be on stage for like 13 hours straight and to maintain that energy. How do you think he does that? Is that genetic or is that just some well, he, skill he does have he does, he does have extra growth hormone maybe yeah, so that so, so it could be that but honestly i don't think i don't think uh i think you can do that now you can't do that every day of your life right, right, and you, right. you can do it for stretches you know you're you, you know going through the yeah. navy seal training you you were able to do things that you didn't think you could do yeah. uh i i later on i actually facilitated uh his part of his master university where i had to do that you know i've done that in programs. I think anyone can do that. It's a lot of it's mindset. You can generate yeah. energy. Yeah, you know, right. people think I need my coffee. I need, you know, caffeine. You, no, you don't. I don't, I've never had caffeine you know, really? I can't say I've never had, but I've never had coffee. Last cup of coffee I can remember having, or even a sip of coffee was my grandmother's and I hated it, but <laughs> I have a lot of energy when I need it. So I think right. that's something we can all generate. And also that would be what Tony would want you to know. It's he doesn't want you to look up to him and say, oh, my God, look at him. He's so great. You know, just like you don't want people doing that to you. I don't want people right. doing that to me. It's just here's what's possible. If you want it, go for it. You can do this, too. That's right. Yeah. So you left there and you started your own um, consulting and training business. Um, what was that journey like? I mean, how did you get into working with Intel or not, not Intel, but um, Cisco and Microsoft and some of these big companies, Wells Fargo, other companies like that? Yeah, it started with a company actually that didn't do well. I had a company called Heroes and Legends and okay. we were written up in Success Magazine and we were going to do, uh, well, we did do big programs. I had uh, a partner in it. We had 30 employees. We had pretty good revenue, but we're doing these big programs and bringing in, brought in Tony, brought in uh, Pat Riley, you know, who was big at the time, was a mm -hmm. you know Lakers coach and that type of thing, all these big names. And so we're paying out big fees. We're right. renting out big venues. We're paying all our employees and I'm making no money. <laughs> <laughs> I have like been literally there, no money for way, like a couple there. of years. Oh my gosh. And, uh, and so then we ended up uh, shutting that down, which, you know, was like, I didn't want to do it. Right. Cause I, I was, I'm one of those people that just believes like, no, it can be done. It can be done. It can be done. I think finally my wife said, Hey, you got to stop this. Like you're working, you know, 18 hours a day and you're not making any money. And literally I was pumping money into the company. Right. Uh, fortunately, I had some assets, but <clears throat> that was a tough one. But it's really what led to everything I'm doing now, because through that experience, we had made some connections with big companies. Because when I was with Tony, it was all the masses. It was individuals that were coming. We weren't right. really connecting with uh, big companies. It was, right. you know, sometimes they would send people, but it was individuals putting credit cards down. And then I tried to do Heroes and Legends, which was, you know, uh, individuals putting credit cards down. You know, mm -hmm. big, big companies we're talking to, but the individuals would pay. But we made some connections there. And then I, I said, hey, corporate training. You can go in. You can work with a company. They write you one check. It's incredibly right. profitable because I didn't need as many people. Right. And so I started doing that. And I didn't know if I was going to do it forever. But then 
it just started growing. And we got into companies like uh, Cisco Systems has been a huge, great client customer for us. But Salesforce, Microsoft, a lot in tech and then also in the financial world like uh, MetLife, uh, Bright House Financial, Principal, lots of companies like that. Right, right. So what do you do with these companies? I mean, what specifically, like if, for a listener, be like, that's really interesting, Cisco, but what do you do? Like how, what value have you brought to the company or its leaders? Yeah, so we do, we do a couple things, but you know, sometimes a uh, company will bring me in and I'll do a keynote. So it'll be like, you know, we were just talking with a couple uh, companies earlier today that I'm going to come in in January and we're going to do their sales kickoff for the year. So right. peak performance, and I've worked with uh, four Olympic gold medalists on that. So peak performance work, that's part of what we do. But the big part of what we do, actually two things. Uh, one is we, we show people how to communicate messages and drive action. And that's mm. our presentation speaking. I wrote, I wrote a book called Win the Presentation Game. Mm -hmm. so a lot of people are out communicating to their teams or communicating to customers. They're playing the game, but they don't know how to win. They're just right. doing what they see everyone else do. So we feel like we have a way that really enables them to drive action quicker in a way that's good for the customer. So it's not like, you know, getting them to do something they don't want to do or need to do, but help them make a decision to take an action that's good for them and then good, obviously, for the communicator. Right. And then the other area is leadership. So we work with senior executives uh, in a lot of these companies around leadership, around building culture, around what I call surrounding yourself with winners, making sure you've got the right people on your team. And then another area that I, I love to talk about is a, a be your team CEO, which is chief emotional officer, chief energy officer, and chief engagement officer. Mm. What um, has surprised you about the corporate work? The well, something I didn't know that was going to happen that did happen was almost all our business now comes to us and yeah. it comes via relationships. So if someone's trying to get into the, the, the corporate corporations to do training and they're cold calling, it's going to be a really, really tough road to do that. Yes. When you have relationships and then people go to another company, like the reason we we're in Microsoft was because an executive from Cisco systems went to Microsoft and then brought us along mm -hmm. into that. So I think the big thing uh, in my new book, The Breakthrough Code, one of the big things, one of the habits I have uh, in there is to create your network of empowerment. And mm -hmm. the thing that I guess has really surprised me is now, again, I've been doing it a long time, Mark, so I'm, I'm an old guy. But uh, when you create this network of empowerment, the business really becomes easy because yeah. you've got all these great relationships that are either bringing you in directly or referring you. It just it just and that was really surprising because I was used in that used to in that business to consumer that I started with Tony Robbins is like you got to go out there every day and find somebody new to bring into right. a program. Yeah, no, I, I am experiencing that now with our corporate training, which yeah. we're pretty early in. It's like it, all of our business has been referral from people, from leaders that we worked with individually who said, you know what, I got to bring this to my company. And then, like you said, if they move to another company, they bring us along. That's really powerful. And isn't that true about most success in life is that relationships? So let's, you know, because I mean, it's the principle in your new book. Um, which I thought was really good, by the way. I thank you for sending me an advanced copy. I was yeah. uh, super thrilled to write a little blurb for you. The Breakthrough Code. Talk about uh, where that came from and, and um, you know, some of the, the principles you think would be relevant for listeners in 2022. Yeah, I, it came from, you know, 30 years of really looking at what is it that allows people like you or Tony Robbins or anybody to, to, to create breakthroughs in areas where they get a little stuck yeah. But they don't stay stuck or they don't just, you know, I'm stuck and then just fall back and go, I guess it can't be done. They literally create breakthroughs. And and I said and what I like to do too, Mark, this is part of I think what I'm really good at is to take something complicated because it's probably pretty complicated, but then to simplify it, say, OK, right. here's what you do. Boom, boom, boom. 
Right. So the breakthrough code that, that would yeah. work universally. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I like really no more than three things, which is hard sometimes because you're like, oh, really? It should be like five. And like, OK, well, <laughs> how do you make it three? Like, how can you weave without losing the power? How can you weave the fourth and fifth thing into one of the, the, the first three? Right. Uh, also, by the way, that's important in speaking. What we right. always help people do because they'll go with the 10 keys to blah, blah, blah. And I remember I used to do that and I'd yeah. get into key number five and I, I'm supposed to be teaching them the 10 keys. I can't remember what number five is, right? I got to look <laughs> down. And so I know they're never going to remember it after I stop talking. So right. everything now for me is in threes. Is that right? Uh, awesome. So the breakthrough code, really, there's three, what I call big ideas. And once you understand these, you truly can live what I call a life without limits. It doesn't mean that everything's perfect all the time, mm -hmm. but it means where you find a limit that you don't want to have, you can break through it. Mm -hmm. Now there'll be other limits that'll show up. That's right. how we grow. But the, the first idea is, and I see it, you know, I see it in you. I see it in, in all great people is they're not trying to be great at every single thing. They're not trying to create a breakthrough, you know, at every, uh, single area of their life. Like some areas are probably doing okay, yeah. but what they do is they focus, I call it focus on less and then obsess, which is our first big idea. Now, nice. some people get freaked out by the word obsess, but I'm not necessarily talking about a conscious obsession. Sometimes that can be unhealthy if you're consciously obsessed with just one area of your life. But we have two minds. We have our conscious mind, which processes about 40 bits of information per second. And that's what most people obsess mm -hmm. with their conscious mind. Right. But it's already pretty limited, right? So you try to obsess with it, you're, <laughs> you're taking more of its power away. We have this, people call it a subconscious, I call it a super conscious. And by the way, I don't think it resides just in your head. I think it extends no. out beyond you. I agree with that. Uh, yeah. yeah. And that's where you want to create the obsession because it can process, and this is probably not even the true number, but according to research that, you know, or people, you know, that are in the know, they say it can process 40 million bits of information per second. Right. But honestly, I think it connects into uh, kind of a universal consciousness. So there really are no limits on that. And right. that's where you want, that's what you want to program to obsess on because it doesn't really have the 40 bit per second limitation. It doesn't <laughs> sleep. It's, it's, it's out there connecting in our dreams, you know, potentially like through astral travel. I don't want to get too weird here, mm -hmm. but there's all sorts of things that it can do and it can bring people into your life. It can notice things that consciously you never notice right. that are happening, a conversation that you're drawn to. It's that intuition that you feel sometimes. So that's our first big idea. So, hey, before we move on, how do we do this? How do we how do we connect with our superconscious so that we can obsess from that perspective? Yeah, the best the best times to do it are when you're in an alpha state uh, or even in a deeper brainwave state. But most people do it in alpha and you tend to be in an alpha state when you wake up in the morning. So, you know, you're you're it's almost like daydreamy. You're not mm -hmm. quite out of your sleep. Beautiful time to connect with your super conscious mm -hmm. and, 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 and also before you go to bed, or then you could go into an alpha state. Like I, I was just in one prior to me coming on with you where I went into alpha state and I was doing some programming of my super conscious. And I, I think I, I, I heard an episode uh, of your podcast and uh, we have this same habit in common. I call it, see it, feel it, believe it, and then let it go. Let the mm -hmm. superconscious do its work. Mm -hmm. And so, but if you can't see it and you can't feel it and you don't believe it, it's just a fairy tale. Like right. your superconscious is going to go, well, you don't believe it. You know, you can't see it. Show me what it looks like. Show me what you want to accomplish. You know, right. show, to, uh, show or not show me, but, but let me experience how it feels when you have it, when it's accomplished, when it's done. Yes. And, and make sure that you have that feeling of certainty where this is a tough one too, Mark, because uh, I, I heard you tell your story about when you were an accountant and wanted to be a Navy SEAL and there's only mm -hmm. a certain amount of spots, but you knew right. that you had one of those spots. I think that's what you said, right? Yeah. 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 But it was, it was the power of visualization and feeling it first. And I practiced that 
and it took time. Yeah. But then that certainty suddenly showed up and that's when I knew it was going to happen. So and you're right. This, you, that yeah, was, the, you, that was charging the super conscious. Yeah. Yeah. And that's what you do. Like some people, when they can't see it, feel it or believe it, they just give up. You got to keep carving it, keep carving right. it in, keep in right. and, and a great way for people that can't, um, they say, I can't visualize well is describe it to yourself. Like describe right. it as you're visualizing, you know, I'm, I'm waking up, I'm feeling this way. And, you know, maybe you're not seeing it crystal clear like you and I are looking at each other, right. but, but just keep carving it away and describe it. And when you get to that point of certainty, then the super conscious is locked in and right. everybody can get there. But most people will quit because it's not easy right away. It's not right. easy because they haven't practiced it just like anything else. 100% agree with that takes practice and takes time and patience. Yeah, That's really one, cool. One, one other thing I would say, though, on this too, the other thing that the super conscious really responds to is when whatever this breakthrough you want, this result, I don't even call it a goal. A goal, when I think of a goal, it's something I want. I, I call it a result because when I think of a result, it's something that's done. So yeah. it creates more certainty in me. And when you are programming a result in, so you're seeing it as if it's already happened. That's part of the process. That's what we do with athletes. We have them see it already being done before it's done. Right. But feeling that level of certainty so the inner mind sees it done, sees it accomplished. But the other thing I think that's important is we all have a purpose in life. We're all here mm -hmm. for mm -hmm. a unique reason. You know, mm -hmm. I'm sure you've heard the Mark Twain quote, the two most important days of your life, right? The yeah. day you were born and the day you find out why. <laughs> and when you can connect a result to your purpose, then right. the super conscious really charges up. If it's just like, for instance, if somebody wants to um, just make a lot of money, to make a lot of money, you know, it'll go kind of hard for that and maybe you'll get it. But if you want to make a lot of money or have a big net worth because your purpose in life is to help other people uh, accomplish their dreams or, or show them what's possible. And so you're connecting, hey, if I'm going to be able to show other people what's possible uh, in life, then then I need to, if, if I can create a big result, a goal for making a lot of money, then I should be able to do that, right? And by doing that, I'm going to be a better teacher to other people how to break through their limitations. Now, all of a sudden, it's not just the money. It's, it's a means to actually fulfilling your purpose, becoming better at fulfilling your purpose. And so that's what I do. And, and my goal in life is to help people see who they really can be and, and just come out of their shell. I see people in boxes, even myself. I know I'm in a box. Even though I've done some nice things in life, I know I'm still boxing myself in and I'm trying to break out of that box. And, mm -hmm. and, and if I can do that, and, and have little results in my life or big results in my life, I'll get better at helping other people do it too. Indeed. I, I love that. Okay. So what's the second principle in your breakthrough code? Second big idea is to upgrade your story, upgrade your life. And this is a trick question to most people. You'll probably, uh, probably not for you, but what's the most powerful story you'll ever hear? Most powerful story I ever hear is usually around um, can't and won't, Shouldn't and couldn't. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And that's powerful power in a negative way. That's right? negative. But I'm saying the negative stories are extremely powerful because they, yeah. they keep you trapped in that box you're talking about. A very limited yeah. box. Yeah. Well, I love it. The most powerful story anyone will ever hear are the, is the one they tell themselves of that's right. who they are, what's possible, uh, right. how, you know, what are they meant to do? And so, and, and Mark, you know, like we all have part of our stories are created very early on when we don't have any filters. So from right. age one or zero to six or seven, depending upon the research, we are living in an alpha state, in a hypnotic state right. where right. we watch our parents, our parents say, you know, it's life is tough. You just can't ever get ahead. Uh, or you, you know, you gotta beware, everyone's out to get you, <laughs> things mm -hmm. like that. And we're just like, cause we're trying to learn how to walk and eat and what to touch and what not to touch. and you know, how to treat other people. And there's a lot going on. So, so we're built as humans to be in, in a hypnotic state where everything's just kind of popping in our minds. And then later on, we figure out why am I always 
you know, so defensive around people. Well, you know, my dad, my, not my dad, because my dad passed away when I was young, but, you know, someone could say, go back and go, yeah, my dad was, you know, saying people are always out to get you. And right. so we have to, to, a couple of things we have to do. We have to let go of the old baggage. Right. We literally have to figure out like, what's going on? Why am I not feeling good? Like when you're going for a result, you'll have sometimes emotions pop up. Like, oh, I don't think I'm going to get there. Well, why do I think I'm not going to get there? Like what's showing up? And you have to be a detective. You have to do the research of what's underneath there. What is the belief, the experience, the, the thought, and you've got to get rid of it. You've got to extract it. Right. Most people think, no, you just pile on more positive. That's hard to do. Because if you have this thing, you know, down below and you're just putting positive on top of it, it's still going to keep popping up. Right. When you extract it, now you create room for more positive, for more positive story, thoughts, emotions, and then I call superchargers. So what I help people do is figure out what's stopping them right now and then literally extract it. And there's lots of really cool, powerful techniques you can do to do that. Like where they're really gone. The emo Even if the memory is still there the the energy attached to the memory is gone right. so you can think about it but it doesn't throw you off anymore right and NLP then you can is, put NLP in is really good about that right i mean that's what's one of that the, that's one of the powers of NL, nlp neuro linguistic programming yeah nlp and a, and a lot of uh energy right. psychology and energy right. healing work is really good for that right. uh and then on top of that once you create space by letting go of your old baggage then you can create a story. So for instance, my story literally for speaking, the one I tell myself before I get up to speak in front of a lot of people is I loved being with this, with this team or this group. They're like my friends and family. I connected with them instantly. We had a blast. I used my whole voice and body to make what I said fascinating. And then I have, so those are some thoughts. I call them OPTs, optimal performance thoughts. And then emotions, you know, I, I say I'm loving, caring and connected. I'm literally feeling like love for these people and a connection mm -hmm. and I care for them. You know, and remember in that first sentence, you know, they're like my friends and family. Total mind game. Right. Like most of the time I'm doing what my mom told me not to do. She said, don't talk to strangers. <laughs> and, you know, this is great because I know you, but most of the time I'm talking to strangers. Right. But I feel really good about being with them because I feel like they're friends. And all it is, is a story, not even a true story, but a story I tell myself that I believe in. And I really do feel like they're friends. Like, yeah, yeah. And it's crazy, you know, yeah. how, how you can not trick your mind, but mold your mind into being the, because, because I tell people, I don't really care if my story is accurate. I just want to have a story that allows me to be the best I can be. That's right. Stories in the eyes of the beholder, right? Yeah. You know, our mind is here to shape our reality. So when, when we take control of our minds, we can take control of the story, which will yeah. then shape the reality. That's a really one other thing I would say that example. you're that you're really good at, and uh, is the last part. The last one I'll just add on the story. A lot of people can create a story, Mark, and then the first time that the story gets challenged, because life will challenge your new story. Right. Life is sitting sure. there. Oh, you're creating a new story, huh, Divine? <laughs> yeah. Let's, and it's yeah, just let's waiting. Close. Like, you know, bring that new story out here. Let me <laughs> let me test it. And so stuff gets thrown at you. You get kicked in the ass, right? You get not literally, but it feels like that with adversity and challenges. And then most people waffle. They're like, oh, you know, it can't be true. And, you know, the same thing that made you such a great seal, the 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 top person in your class, like you got to stick to your story. You've right. got to stick to the new story. Even when it doesn't look like you should, you've got to stick to that story. And, and, and it's just like, you know, making it stronger and boldening that story. And then it really take life. That's cool. And so what is, what's a, uh, a simple, well, if it's simple, what's a good strategy to stick to a story when you're really suffering and you're down? Like, let's, let's put this to, to yeah. related to the pandemic. A lot of people, their stories were kind of shattered in 2020, 2021. And, uh, you know, they don't want to um, continue living a broken story, right? And so that's why yeah. we have the, the great resignation. 25% of the workforce has quit. The story's not working for them. And so they're in the middle of concocting a new story. So let's assume that we've, a lot of them have, or listeners have kind of figured that out. 
So what's a good strategy for helping them stick to their new story in 2022? Yeah, well, it comes down to grit. Uh, it also comes down to, I think, being prepared to just know it's going to get challenged. I think mm -hmm. most people, when they, they set out on a goal, I'll use that word. I don't like using that word. They set on a goal. They, they have a fairy tale. <laughs> they have a fairy tale story in their head. Oh, I got this goal. It's going to be great. It's going to be easy. We're going to get there quick. Mm -hmm. You know, no challenges. It's not true. But yeah. the universe is always working in your favor. That's a big theme in the book, too. Like the, uh, what I did with my book, it's a parable. So it's a story. And I wanted to make it real because my life, I've had some successes, but I've had a ton of challenges, like mm -hmm. just stuff like I'm what? Come on. What did I do to deserve this? Yeah. But the reality is when you look back and I know when you look when you look back in your life, when I look back in my life, I go, wow, that made me. Yeah. That thing that I thought was like so terrible and awful and what happened to me, that shifted my mind, that 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 broke down an old story that made me have to create a new story. Right. And, and so I, I, um, one thing that I do tell my kids, I said, you know, I, I've told them for a long time, there's always an advantage, no matter what happens, there's always an advantage. And so for me, when COVID hit, I literally had that thought in my head. I'm not trying to make myself, you know, seem like, wow, isn't he great? Cause I wasn't, but I was just prepared for anything. Like when you've have enough, adversity in your life and ambiguity like I've had in my life. It's like COVID didn't phase me. And right. we and, and my training business was about 96% myself or my team flying out, doing engagements or coaching <laughs> sessions all over the world. Right. And boom, like I was right. even worried, Mark, coming into March, I was looking at, oh my God, why did I put all this on my schedule? Like, this is crazy. You know, I don't want to have to go to Australia and come back and then go to London and then and then go to London again the next week and do. And then uh, the universe said, oh, OK, we got you. And it wiped it all off. The plate. <laughs> don't even worry about it, Tom. But it didn't freak me out. It was just like, all right, I need to we need to virtualize our business anyways. Let's do it. And we had a bad couple months, right, where we didn't a lot of revenue. Some we still got paid on because it was contracted. But, you know, we had we had a couple tough months uh, and then we we kicked it up like after about three or four months where we were doing as much business virtual as we were doing face to face, created no some kidding. new programs. And then this year we'll have profitability wise, we'll have our best year ever. Mm -hmm. So and mm -hmm. we're still you know, I'm going out a little bit, but not very much. But I think get excited about whatever happens when some when some stuff shows up that's going to challenge your story. You should be you should have that Navy SEAL mentality, right? You know, the, <laughs> not you, but the people because mm -hmm. you have it. You should be like, all right, let's go, baby. Bring it on. Yeah, yeah let's go. I love that. Yeah, because, you know. Change is persistent and it seems to be getting faster and more intense. You know, we're in that kind of exponential age disruption is the name of the game. So we have to learn how to disrupt ourselves. And if we're running an organization or a team, we have to learn how to disrupt that. Yeah. And then so we're, so we're in a constant evolutionary state, not when the crisis hits. That's what I believe. We need to become self-evolutionary and make that a day-by-day -day practice in essence yeah. so that when the change comes, we just, we're just rolling it because we've already, we've already changed ahead of the change. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's what I say. You either you either disrupt or you will be disrupted. And so Correct. the people that are constantly disrupting themselves kind of and I and, and when I was younger, I never wanted to be disrupted. I was like, I just wanted right. things to go smooth and easy. Now yeah. my team's always saying, Hey, stop changing things. <laughs> and like, you know, yeah. like we just got this training down and then you added this new thing in. I go, right. Yeah, but it's better, right? It's, I, it's I do be the same thing. It drives my team crazy. And we're finally <laughs> getting used to the constant change. And so it's been my little training program for the team. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> That's awesome, Tom. Yeah. Oh man. So we got to uh, wrap up here pretty soon. I want to take much more of your time, but uh, what's, what's the future hold for you? Like are you going to continue doing the corporate work or, you know, do you have some other vision that's unfolding? Yeah. So my life is, uh, my life has been really interesting. Back in 2015, I got chronic fatigue because I was traveling all around and not mm -hmm. sleeping different time zones and, and so, and I got a little virus, you know, this is prior to COVID. That's why COVID didn't freak me out. I, I, I got a virus back in 2015 and, and because I, I had let my immune system get worn down, 
you know, it really threw me for a loop. And so for like mm. eight, nine months, I had very little energy, hard to get out of bed and sleeping like, you know, 10, 11, 12 hours a day and exhausted. Mm. But one of the things that I delved into, and I've always had an interest in it, was um, was, was energy healing. Because I, I, right. I, I don't, I go to MDs, but I go to more functional MDs if I ever have mm -hmm. an issue. I don't go to doctors very often at all. Me neither. But yeah. then I was even going into like alternative medicine and, you know, trying different treatments and I wasn't getting better. And the only thing that got me better was really uh, some energy psychology right. techniques because my amygdala, the problem was it was just overactivated. I was in right. fight or flight because this virus didn't go away. And I'm used to like, first of all, not getting sick. And then if I get sick, I, I come back quick and that didn't happen. And so I had to, I had to re-energize my amygdala, my, I reprogram it basically. Yeah. And, and so then I got really fascinated in, uh, in, in with energy healing and how uh, everything's energy. I've always mm -hmm. believed that Einstein said everything's energy mm -hmm. and that uh, energy follows thought. So with mm -hmm. our minds, we can heal mm -hmm. and we can even provide energy for other people, send people energy. Mm -hmm. I think that's a lot of what I learned from Tony Robbins. Like mm -hmm. he, I remember him telling me, before he goes into a big room of people, he literally is visualizing his energy leaving him, right? And going and circling the room and empowering people. And that was a long time ago That's that cool. he shared that with me. So uh, I hosted this past year, the Global Energy Healing Summit, which was really cool. I interviewed 41 different people that, uh, and it could be some more experts on what to eat because food is energy, right? right? Everything's energy. Right. And some were traditional energy healers where they actually send energy to people that have diseases or right. uh, conditions that they need help from. And that was mind blowing. And by, by the way, I, I have to tell you, I just participated in a group coherence healing with Joe Dispenza. You know, the oh, cool. The yeah, author he's awesome. of, uh, yeah, the placebo effect. It was fascinating. And I did it partly because it was offered for me as a veteran. Yeah, it was, it was free. And, the, and they would have you in this session where. There's prep from from Joe, and this is all taped. I think he, you know, yeah, the program was kind of virtualized for him. But then they had um, 18 people come in who were trained healers, and you literally you turn your your computer screen off. There's four people in it besides uh, four people who are these the subjects, the healies, and then these 18 people will go through each one and do exactly what you're talking about. Focus yeah. their their healing attentional energy. And it was really interesting. And then you have a little survey as part of it, like how did it affect? And this one woman, Joy, was completely transformed in five sessions. Wow. You know, and I've done a ton of work and I, and I like, what did you feel? And I said, well, I felt a lightness, you know, and I felt warmth in my heart, you know, because these people were directing their energy. And you were me. sending it out to them or you no, were receiving I was re it? I was receiving it. Oh, receiving. I was receiving. Okay, Yeah, cool. because it was offered to me as a military vet. And yeah, yeah, yeah. I like to, I like to vet things that I'm recommending yeah. to vets, you know what I mean, so to speak. Yeah. So like I've tried a lot of the healing modalities that because we've got a, a veteran organization called the Courage Foundation. Mm -hmm. So, you know, if someone says, hey, you know, brain stimulation is very helpful to heal TBI. I'm like, OK, let me try it, you know, mm -hmm. make sure there's no adverse side effects. So I did right. brain stim last year and and a few other things that I probably won't go into right now. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Anyway, so that was one of them, Joe Dispenza. But my point is, I really agree with you on this, uh, the, the whole sense of we can, you know, and this is more of the future work. So as I'm really excited to hear you getting into that, yeah. um, people working together to heal each other and the, to heal the environment, you know, that's, if we can scale that, then that'll change the world. Absolutely. I, I ran into, and I'll introduce you to this guy, but I ran into a, a guy, I actually heard about his work in 2015. I just interviewed him, 77 year old, uh, guys, coolest guy. Uh, he's, he lives in the, uh, in Appalachia. And, uh, so, you know, he's got a Southern accent. He lives on 350 acres. Nice. He's the least likely person you would ever think is an energy healer or an energy master. Right. But he was a construction foreman and, and, uh, he learned about Silva mind control back in the seventies. Yeah. And I've been to a few of those courses. Yeah. I know. So. Yeah. No, I've been through them too. And, and he, um, and then he became one of their top instructors and then he, uh, connected with um, Native American uh, shamans, medicine men, 
and learn from them. And then he got into dowsing. You know, a lot of people think dowsing is just to find water, mm -hmm. but you can douse to remove energy. You can douse to put energy into uh, situations. Hmm. And and he said, you know, and you know, so he has like a little pendulum. His is, uh, you'll love it. His is like a 45 caliber shell because he's a mountain <laughs> man, right? He, he wears a hat and he, he has like a, uh, you know, a, a a revolver <laughs> he awesome. goes into town he says i love this guy but he's the kindest coolest guy that you'll ever meet and uh and he's, he's become a good friend of mine but uh he says all you really need is intent but he's done amazing things like mark you mentioned healing the the planet mm -hmm. uh just a couple quick stories so there was a he said in canada someone called him up and their well had arsenic in it well, water had arsenic in it. He was 3,000 miles away. There's somebody that knew him. And his, his work has, has been spread into 142 different countries. So he's pretty wow. well known around the world. Now. Okay. Yeah, yeah. And uh, they said, you know, we've got arsenic. Our water is not drinkable. He said, all right, let me work on it. And he literally worked on it with his mind, turning the arsenic, the frequency of arsenic into water. Now, some people are like, whoa, 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 this is a little weird. Yeah, but it's really fascinating. And they measured it the next day, the Canadian authority, whatever measures it. And they said 90% of the arsenic that was in there yesterday is gone. He said, well, give me another, give me another day. And, and uh, he worked on it again. And they measured it like 30 days later. And it, it was almost all gone. Um, he's working with groups that are using the power of their mind to clean up rivers around the world. Oh, fantastic. Um, he had a farmer call him up and say, uh, I need your help. Uh, we had some weeds in our alfalfa, so he's growing like uh, uh, hay. And I called the whatever the the spraying agency is. They came out and sprayed it, but they sprayed it with Roundup. Oh no! Roundup, if you know, is like the worst. So it killed everything. Now my friend, his name is Raymond. He didn't know that 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 that. Well, he knew it was sprayed with Roundup, but he thought it was just sprayed. And the guy said, "Can you help me?" And he said, "Well, let me work on it." And he says, "You know what? I didn't know. I didn't know I couldn't do it. So I just worked on it." And he, he mentally turned the Roundup into fertilizer. And hmm. he said, you know, call me back and see what happens. He didn't hear back from the friend until 30 days later. The friend sent him a picture where the hay had grown to like five feet tall, the, lar the, the biggest crop they'd ever had. Instead of getting three cuttings, he got five cuttings. And then he told my friend Raymond, yeah, there was nothing even left after the roundup because it was done like a week before I called you. And Raymond said, if I would have known that, I might not even have done it. But because he didn't know that and he, he used his mind right now, again, this might be freaking people out, but this is where yeah. I'm really going with my work. Yeah, and what the breakthrough code is really a lot about. It's like using your mind to to create results that you would never get just with hard work or, right, right. you know, you still have to put the work in. But using your mind as a precursor that allows you to create results that you'd never get any other way. Hundred percent. Yeah, I think. Um, I mean, you're on to something. The, the 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 age we're in is no longer the information age. We're in the conceptual age, and so everything that we would learn to do in the in the industrial and the information age as human beings is going to be outsourced to AI and robots. And so, what's left is the humanness of creativity and and conceptualization. And so, you know, people need to re, you know, tell a new story about what's possible. And that's what you're doing with the breakthrough code. Yeah. And I love the story about the Appalachian guy. I'd love to meet him and, and interview him as well. It reminds me of a really cool uh, book series I read called Ringing Cedar series. It's about this woman who grew up in the Taiga or Tiaga, you know, basically the Siberian forest. And she lived, a, you know, I guess she was raised by her grandparents, but they, you know, she wanted to live in the woods. So she stayed in the woods and she had befriended the animals, you know, so the bears would dig for her and the wolves protected her and the eagles looked out for her. Fascinating story. And her power, she was, she's from this ancient line of Vedic, you know, philosophers and, and um, you know, yogis, essentially. I didn't realize that the Vedic tradition extended far into Russia, but it did. Yeah. Wow. Um, Anyway, so her, her gift was this intense power to see and to shape reality through her, through her mind with imagery. Yeah. And the reason I brought it up, because this whole idea of collective healing tells a fascinating story about a future vision she had about children focusing their minds to essentially disable nuclear weapons. 
Wow. I Isn't that it. incredible? Yeah. Just, and just I believe that's true. Super inspiring. I think it's possible too through yeah. microbial network or whatever, mycelium network. There's some, you know, and it could be just energy or it could be activating, you know, the power of, of the mother earth essentially to destroy the weapons through decay or through, you know, yeah. biology devouring them or something. It's just fascinating. There's a lot more we can talk about on this because that, that's yeah. really interesting. We'll have to do that another day. But one thing yeah. I will say, I do agree a lot of the jobs that, that will go away and, you know, and some that people have gotten used to for a long time, the manufacturing jobs yeah. and, and different uh, jobs like that. And people are in fear. But the good thing, and, and my, my friend Raymond, uh, you know, told me this, I do believe it. He's, he said that he's been measuring energy in people. So with your with a, a pendulum, you know, you can, well, in using a scale, you can measure energy. And I don't know yeah. what it relates to, but he said, you know, back in the 70s when he started measuring energy, uh, you would see, or maybe it was in the 90s he started measuring, but like 30 years ago, he started measuring energy. And he said, like a, a good, healthy guy like you with good thoughts, you would have the equivalent of whatever scale this was, like 30,000, right? You know, you could measure your energy and it would come to mm -hmm. 30,000. And then, you know, if someone was not, healthy or they had destructive habits. It could go all the way down to zero potentially. Mm -hmm. But he said every year it was growing. Every yep. year he measured, you know, it was growing. And he said in the past year, it's grown more than, than in the past 23 years or however many years he's been doing it. Fascinating. And he said now, so it used to be like, you know, 30,000 was like, you know, top of the top. Now he said he's measuring people with 150,000. And again, it's not like voltage or yeah, I'm yeah. not exactly sure. He doesn't even know exactly what, what it is. But think of like more energy available to create. That's the way I think of it. I or do. more energy available to destruct, which you're also seeing. I think people have so much of this creative power. They're not knowing how to use it yet, which right. is why you're seeing all this. Complex. This. Um, yeah you know, what's happening in our world too. So if we can get it to be more creative yep. and uplifting for everybody, we're in a great place to transition from the menial labor, the manufacturing roles to really creating an amazing evolution of who we are. A hundred percent agree. And there's tons more to say on that too, but we've kind of run up against the, uh, the hour here. Man, what a fascinating conversation. So the energy healing, um, you're gonna run that again next year. Where can people learn more? You're about gonna that? be on it. You're I'm gonna, gonna be, be on, on it. it. Yeah, I'm excited you, about which that. I'm really excited about. Yeah. yeah. So that'll be in March. Okay. Uh, that'll be in the end of March, and uh, you, you you'll hopefully be letting all these people know about it. It's Definitely. not available to sign up for yet. It will be free though, so you can come, and we'll have about sixty different interviews with amazing people like you, Mark, and and lots of other really cool people. So that'll be a lot of fun. And then uh, the book, The Breakthrough Code, is coming out. February 25th and right. uh, the site, the breakthrough code, the breakthrough And uh, if you go there and you buy the book, if you pre-order it, then we also have a really cool master class that normally is about $495, but you get it for free with the nice. pre-order of the book. Awesome. And if someone wanted to connect to you, let's say they, they're interested in, in your coaching or speaking training, where would they find you for that? TomMcCarthy.com. So T-O-M-M-C-C-A-R-T-H-Y.com. Awesome. Well, Tom, thanks so much for, for your time and for putting so much great positive energy in the world and, and uh, being on this co-creative journey with myself and others to, to make the world a better place. Our vision for the future is one of abundance and creativity, right? And, and connection as opposed to, you know, what people are being fed by the mainstream media and you know what most people think so but we got to we've got to create that one person at a time right and you're you're doing an amazing job creating it mark i'm so glad to call you a friend and yeah. to have known you for so many years and just watching your work and in amazement so phenomenal yeah. job thank you tom thank you very much for that and likewise and and happy holidays and we'll look yeah. forward to talking to you again soon who awesome. y'all all right brother take care